You have to be like a judge in a court, carefully weigh the facts and so on. Religion is different. Subject comes from the heart. They'll usually tell you they figured that out themselves. Well, maybe they did, but people have been saying it for a long time. The man who made it the most popular was a man named Schleiermacher, who lived about 140, 150 years ago. At that time, the scientific community were challenging a lot of religious people by saying, look, you really believe this? Look, we have proof it isn't true, and intimidating them that way. Schleiermacher came up with this piece of advice to the religious community. He said, next time somebody tries to bring you some fact to prove you're wrong, you tell them you're not interested because your belief is in your heart. It doesn't depend on what you see with your eyes. There's one last way that people can fool themselves, I suppose, and that is by false analogies, somewhat like I was talking about before, where they'll tell you, look, if you can't understand this, it's like that, which just makes two problems. Now they have to get you to understand this thing and then show you why this thing is really like that thing. But by false analogies, I mean they tell you a nice story, which sounds like it hangs together, but it really isn't the same as the story that they want you to believe. As an example, the same man in Australia said to me, do you understand God? I told him I did, but he wanted to say, no, you can't, and so on. So, okay, for the sake of argument, I don't understand God. He says, if you can't understand God, then how do you expect to understand the Trinity? Well, because these are different things, that's why. God I know about. I have evidence for God. The other item, I haven't seen anything like that. No evidence. Usually it's put this way, very often they'll say, the impossible things are mysteries. That's the same, mysteries. This is something that, it's like the sun. If you turn and look at the sun in just a second, oh, you have to look away, it's too bright, burns your eyes. That's what a mystery is. It's a truth, but it's so big that when you look to it, it just burns out your mind. You just can't examine it. It overloads the circuits. So you have to look away. That's what a mystery is. It's like the sun. Well, it's an interesting kind of a parallel, but it doesn't work. I can't stand and look at the sun, but I know it's there. I can prove it in many ways. Blind men know about the sun. They don't doubt it. They've never seen it, but they know it's there. They can feel it on their face. There's all kinds of ways to make sure the sun is there without looking at it. But when you're talking about a truth, you're saying this is a true thing, which organ do we have that sees truth? We have an eye that sees colors and an ear that perceives sound. What organ do we have that sees truth? It's the mind, just that faculty. It's uh, traditionally said in Islam, the faculty of reason was the best thing God gave man. You recognize the truth with this. It's the only organ you have. If somebody says this is true, there's only one thing to use to look at it, the mind. And if you say this true thing burns out the mind, well, it doesn't even matter if it's true or not. I don't have to believe it. I have no way to make sure of it. There's a lot of things that make my head spin. How can a person be asked, insisted on, that you believe what you're not permitted to see? to say, look, this thing makes your head hurt, but believe it, the more it hurts, the more reward you get, I guess. It doesn't say that in any scripture anywhere in the world that I know of, that your reward comes with the more impossible things you believe, the bigger your reward. But there's also this point, and maybe it's the, the toughest one I try to make, but it's the shortest, I'd be glad to hear, that in spite of all these difficulties, if you say, look, this can't be so because of that and so on, there are those who would still try to say, but God can do it anyway because of what God is. Well, it's a serious logical error to say that God can do anything. It means he can do stupid things. It means he can lie if he wants to. To say God can do anything, blanket coverage. He does godly things to start with, so you should be cautious with that terminology. But where people are using that is to say that, well, God took off some of his godliness, you see, like a coat, and he set it over here, and then he took on the shape of a, a man. 
Well, there's a lot of things that you can take off like a coat, or you could be the prime minister of a country and you can resign, and so this thing leaves you like you took it off like a coat. You can resign a lot of things, you set this aside, but by definition, you can't stop being God. You can't set it aside, it can't be done. For the simple reason that God is not what you are, it's who you are. See, God is unique. There has only ever been one. God is not a job that different people get. It's his turn to be God. God is who you are. When you talk about the God, you only mean this one individual. You're not describing or making a description that could fit some different individuals, but it fits in particular that one. You're talking about who, not what. And if God is who you are, not what you are, you can't take it off. A person can change his name, doesn't matter, he's still who he was before. It's wrapped up in you, you can't separate it. God is who you are, you can't take it off like a jacket, any more than you can put it on. For those who uh, some say that God gives us a little bit of divinity, he makes us a little bit divine, same problem. When you say divinity, you're talking about something that is always the case. It's not an achievement, it's not a goal, it's not something that didn't used to be, but now it is. That's what you mean when you talk about God, divinity. That which is all wrapped up in the identity of an individual. It doesn't come separate from him in any way. The other half of the story, I suppose, concerns man's troubles. As a lot of people will say, by all means, uh, most uh, the human race, I don't suppose, does, but a lot of people will say, uh, man is fallen, so he needs to be saved. Um, this is sort of explained in this way to say that, well, since a man is all corrupted by sin, whatever he does isn't worth anything anyway. So what he has to do is let somebody else do the saving, and then he's, he's changed into something else, a different kind of a creature. Well, the problem is that whole idea doesn't let you get started. You see, if you are corrupted by sin and what you do doesn't count for anything, I'd suggest even when you make a decision to take advantage of the ransom sacrifice or whatever, it still doesn't mean anything, it doesn't count for anything. You're corrupt. You're too corrupt to have anything you do be worth anything, including that. It's something like a verdict that comes up from time to time in court cases. Some man may get a hold of a gun and he kills half a dozen people. They try him in court and they say, well, he's innocent, he was insane. Lost his mind, so he's not really guilty of killing anyone. He was out of his mind. See, it's somewhat the same thing. If you say, man is so corrupted that he cannot do good. And the same people tell you, there's one good thing you can do, you can join up with this outfit and then you'll be saved when really you want to plead insanity. No, I'm, too, I'm too crazy. How do I know I'm doing the right thing? I'm too corrupted by sin. How do I know that's a good idea? My sinful nature fools me. It doesn't let you get started. I'd also suggest that there's one man, he wrote a, an interesting account of uh, some of his activities um, be about 300 years ago. A British man, I believe, but he came to the U.S. He was a Unitarian, uh, no, sorry, a Universalist. And uh, he wrote about how he used to go from city to city and argue with the religious figures in each community. And they were all telling him, you've got to take advantage, you've got to join up so that you're saved from your sins. And he'd always ask him the same story. He'd say, where did I get this sin that I'm guilty of before I did anything? Where did the sin come that I was, I was born with? Where did it come from? And then tell him, well, your great ancestor, Adam, he sinned. He passed that sin down to you. The man says, I don't believe that. And the preacher would say, it doesn't matter if you don't believe it. It's still true. You're guilty. So then he'd say, well, how do I get saved from this sin? He says, you must believe that Jesus paid the price. He says, what if I don't? He says, then it won't help. You must believe it for it to work. So, you see, the picture is... You're guilty whether you believe it or not.